earthquakes, one of the most destructive natural disasters that keeps occurring around the world, especially along close to plate tectonic boundaries, and it's definitely a manifestation of Earth's massive power. And basically, uh, the consequence of a plate tectonic and the formations of the crust, which we discussed in our previous lecture series. And earthquakes are important to study because of the massive dis destruction of life and property that they cause, and also because they help us understand the idea of an active Earth that is constantly changing, and it's actually, earthquakes are part of the reason why Earth is changing, all right? It's a result of the plate tectonics, but it's also what causes changes in the rock as well. So, because although the plate boundaries are, are where the earthquake is happening, the shock wave released by the earthquake can crack rocks thousands of miles away from the actual source of the earthquake. And so earthquakes can be actually transformational forces for the earth as well. And we're going to be talking about all of this in this video. But before we can do this, we have to review the idea of stress and strain because it's have everything to do with what happens during earthquakes. Now remember that whenever you put pressure on an object, if this object is not allowed to move, it's going to be under stress. And under stress, rocks tend to actually change and either fold in what is called ductile strain or crack in what's called brittle strain. And brittle strain, one of the examples of it is actually faulting. And you will see the earthquakes has everything to do with both folding and faulting. All right? Now, that means that fault lines are very important for earthquakes because this is the area upon which most of this stress and strain is going to be taking place. It's areas where the blocks of rock are going to be under constant pressure and moving against each other or away from each other or past each other. So, for example, the infamous San Andreas Fault in California is a place where rocks are moving past each other and constantly having to deform because of these pressures that, that the plates are under. Or rifts, such as the Great African Rift Valley, that's actually a continuation of the rift that started with the Red Sea and is actually cracking with Africa more and more. All of these are examples of places around the Earth where that, those pressures are going to be taking place. Tectonic plate boundaries, which including convergent boundaries where mountains are formed. Um, divergent boundaries are mid ocean ridges and new continental rifts, as we see in the picture. And con and also, transform boundaries like St. Andrew's Fault are all examples of areas where rocks are going to be under the most tension, which is why earthquakes are so common near the boundaries. Now, remember, fault lines or area where lots of faults will be fall, find, and usually this will happen along plate tectonic boundaries, are very important for earthquakes because that's where the rocks are going to be under the most stress and therefore change. Now, when the rocks are under stress, sometimes they're not allowed to move. Right? So you have the plate boundary, and you represented by this drawing here, where you have a fence. Now, if you put a transform boundary, for example, and you push each block relative to each other on this fault, and remember, we know it's a fault, not a fissure, because movement is happening. However, when you think of this, you would think that the movement is slad, steady and slowly, and these rocks are kind of moving past each other slowly but surely. It's not actually what happens. There's not too much friction between the rock to allow the rock to kind of like slip past each other ever so slow, gently. In fact, what actually happens is that because of the pressure, the rock actually bends out of shape and sticks, sticks to itself and does not move. And we call that a locked fault. Now, it's still a fault, not a joint, because there is pressure causing this to try to move. And so because of the friction between the two, the two things, though, they don't. And so the only thing the rock can do because of the pressure that's under or the stress that's under is to bend in the characteristic S shape of the shear stress. Now, this will continue until the pressure is so big that it will overcome the friction that exists between both blocks. And then in a sudden moment, something that's called a rupture will take place. Usually it cracks the rocks and forces the rocks to kind of like slip past each other. And then as soon as they slip, the bending that had taken place over thousands of years of stress and strain will actually suddenly release and go back to normal. And you see that there. The banding that existed here no longer exists at the, after the, the actual event. So the rupture is followed by an elastic rebound, or the idea that the rock, because it has an elastic property, it was ductile, it was bending, it was folding, but then after the slippage, it cracked and released that, ten, that energy, and it went back to normal, to its original shape.
But as it did this, it pushed the rocks that were around it, sending, sending a shock wave of energy, what we call seismic waves, and recognize as the earthquake. So earthquakes are a result of stress, which puts ductile strain in the rocks because they are locked in a fault that does not move, even though it wants to move. And that makes the rock fold until it finally the, the, the rock fault is overcome and the friction is overcome by the pressure. And then the rock slips and, or sometimes even cracks, allowing the rock to have enough room to return to normal in its elasticity, sending a shock wave that actually causes the earthquake. So to see some examples of this actually happening, for example, along the transform boundary, like we just said, uh, like in St. Andrew's Fault, one piece is moving relative to the other, and so what's going to happen is that the rocks, which were originally aligned, will actually bend and make that characteristic S shape of, of the shear stress, and then after a while, as this friction that exists in between both rocks is overcome, by the shear stress that's being applied in opposite directions will cause the rock to finally rupture, crack, and shift. And as it shifts, it's allowed to rebound back to normal, which sends the shock wave. And then after the earthquake, you will notice that the rock has shifted or that it has actually moved, which is why we call it a fault, because these movements are taking place over the course of millions and millions of years. So what you actually find along tectonic plate boundaries is a lot of rocks under pressure on their strain, ready to go, ready to crack and release this energy. And the plate tectonics movements of crust against crust actually happen in sudden bursts over periods of, after a long, long period of gathering the energy and deformation of the rock until the rock can finally not take it. All right? Now, an example that is subduction zones is the same thing will happen. For example, if you have a plate that's going underneath another plate, because there's a, a friction between the two plates, it may become locked, which causes the compression or shortening of the plate that's above it, and the plate will be uplifted, cause it like a slight little mountain. So you see here, for example, and like this island was originally underwater, and only this part was above where you have the plants, but because of a, of a uplift event, this whole section actually got bent upwards, exposing some of the island that was used to be underwater. The, and then, suddenly, when that, that, that friction is finally overcome, a rupture takes place, and then you have a sudden release of that fold, and you have an extension of the crust subsequently, as it, the elastic bound takes place, the rock suddenly subsides, and you see that happening here, for example, after the earthquake, the houses are now below sea level because of the subsidence that took place, and maybe before they built it, the rock was deformed. But now, it actually went down. It may have taken millions of years for this rock to actually deform, and finally gave up. So, by the time the habitants built their houses there, they didn't know that they were in a tension zone or a compression zone. But after the earthquake happens, these, ro these houses are suddenly subducted or subsided into the, into the, because of the return of the rock to normal. And by the way, since this actually will be pushing rock from both sides, generating the shock wave we recognize the seismic wave, this will also generate a tsunami that propagates through the ocean away from the, the area that actually takes place and also towards the land. And so that's why tsunamis are so common along uh, boundaries of convergence zones. So for example, in any, any of these convergence zones, when you have these truss faults happening here, as you can see, sometimes one plate will actually be locked on another and a block of rock will be forced to bulge up and eventually that tension will release itself or that friction will be overcome allowing the rock to return to normal and an island that maybe was at first underwater above water will go underwater as, as a piece is subducted and another one is uplifted as compression takes place but after the rupture and elastic rebound the island goes back to normal as the piece that was once uplifted subsides and the piece that was subsided uplifts back to normal. And so these things will be happening. For example, the big earthquake that killed lots of people in the early 2000s in Sumatra happens because of the subduction of the oceanic plate underneath where Sumatra is. So you see that one oceanic plate is colliding with another and one is subducting underneath the other and then every time one of these guyots or seamounts actually hits here it puts even more friction which locks the plates but then eventually that tension has to be released 
and and then the the plates will actually return to normal and cause massive earthquakes that form tsunamis, which is what actually folded all that region and flooded a lot of and killed so many people. And so this explains what causes earthquakes and what they're all about. Earthquakes are caused by strain put in rock to the point that it can no longer take, and it's. The strain happens because the rocks are being pushed along a fault line that it becomes lost because of friction between the rocks. And when the friction is finally overcome by the pressure of the stress, the rock slips, fractures, and we're, we're not, an event that's called a rupture. And then subsequently, the elastic rebound as the rupture goes back to normal, sends the shock wave or seismic waves that we recognize as the earthquake. There are a lot of videos or animations on YouTube about this, and I suggest you look it up. Look it up, Elastic Rebound on YouTube and watch an animation so you can actually see what I'm talking about here in, in a video. It's always a good idea to look the words up, the key terms up with videos if you want to get a better explanation. All right? So in the next video, we're going to talk about the anatomy of the earth. See you then.